We're about to send the colorful metaphors out of some Star Trek, but believe it or not, we at CinemaSins actually love Star Trek. So much so that we made a new CinemaSins podcast called Captain's Pod. A show where the CinemaSins crew can review, sin, and talk about everything Star Trek. So whether you're new to Star Trek, a lifelong Trekkie, or anything in between, join us on the USS Enterprise by searching for Captain's Pod or CinemaSins in your podcast player of choice. Until then, enjoy the video and live, live long, long and prosper. I gotta open with a sin-off for Nicholas Meyer, who was asked not once, but twice, to write the franchise's ship, and goddammit if he didn't do a stellar job of it both f***ing times! Stardate 9521.6. Captain's Log, USS Excelsior. Sulu gets to be the f***ing captain of his own starship, and Takei still got a f***ing also starring credit for the film. F*** this franchise is disrespect of any original cast member not named William, Leonard, or DeForest. Hey, they took Excelsior out of space dock! Starships are like hockey prospects. You don't trust them to be ready for the big leagues for at least several years. We're heading home under full impulse power. Why, though? I mean, sure, they only go up to warp 9 when the sh** hits the fan, but warp 2 or 4? Should be no problem. This is like driving home from vacation at 10 miles an hour. I love how Excelsior has a giant schematic drawing of itself on the bridge. There's probably a small arrow with text pointing to the bridge saying, You are here. Let's pause and discuss this sh**. Dude here has brought a device with important information for the captain to see, but that device is huge! Looks like an action figure box! He brought a whole ass board game to show Sulu the latest weather reports. This is a far future! Shouldn't this device be super tiny? Shouldn't the information be displayable on the main screen? The Excelsior survives this. Also, look at these poor bastards getting thrown from their beds. Why are there never any seatbelts in space? Sudden yeoman ran, blah blah blah. It's great to see Grace Lee Whitney, but I still hate the way Star Trek thrusts these f***ing easter eggs in your face with this wink wink nut nut bullshit. I've confirmed the location of Praxis, but... What is it? I cannot confirm the existence of Praxis. Why the f*** would you need to confirm the location of a known Klingon moon? It exists where it exists, based on the principles of physics. You only said it this way so the existent part would sound ominous. No one was questioning the location of Praxis. Then Sulu says on screen, and they show pictures of a blown up Praxis. Like, how f***ing many times is the optical zoom on Excelsior's camera? This kind of image would be literally impossible unless they had camera beacons strewn throughout space and... Come to think of it, Starfleet should definitely invest in a network of space cameras. This transmission ends. Now. Unnecessary words. They will have depleted their supply of oxygen in approximately 50 Earth years. I'm having a hard time believing that one planet or moon is responsible for sustaining the entire Klingon species. There aren't other planets they can move to in the Klingon Empire? Maybe they can't. But the movie doesn't do a great job explaining why this is impossible. Even with the overspending on their military that Spock is about to mention, wouldn't asking for a little moving money from the Federation make more sense than asking them to dismantle all the space stations and weaponry along the neutral zone? Negotiations for what? The dismantling of our space stations and star bases along the neutral zone. An end to almost 70 years of unremitting hostility. Unremitting means incessant or never relaxing. But in the original series, the Organian Peace Treaty was signed between the Klingons and the Federation, which would have 100% relaxed some of the hostility between the two warring factions. I'm not saying there wouldn't need to be some talks, but Spock is acting like there's never been anything done to assist allowing both the Federation and the Klingons to come to a mutual agreement. Me? Well, there are Klingons who feel the same way about the Peace Treaty as yourself and Admiral Cartwright. But they'll think twice about attacking the Enterprise under your command. <laughs> what? Kirk is one step away from retirement, and these movies' beliefs that Kirk and his crew are the only ones capable of stopping whatever big bad comes Starfleet's way says a lot more about the lack of an ability to recruit successfully than it does about how great Kirk is at manning a starship. Also, why does the Federation think Kirk being at the helm will stop the Klingons from trying to attack? The whole f***ing reason Claw attacked the Enterprise in Star Trek V was because Kirk was at the helm. This logic is bullsh**. But a full ambassador would be better equipped if there's no further business. Kirk pauses before he's interrupted. We volunteer. Who's this eavesdropper in the chair back here? There's an old Vulcan proverb. Only Nixon could go to China. Har har. This movie will do this again here in a few with the Shakespeare and the original Klingon and it's nonsensical, unfunny, and frustrating. Don't believe them. Don't trust them. They are dying. Let them die. 
Look, Kirk has never had any love for the Klingons, but this racist grandpa character they make Kirk out to be in this film comes out of left field. I can't believe I have to keep using Star Trek V to defend my points, but in that movie, Kirk has zero qualms with not only saving the Klingon ambassador, but also the Romulan ambassador. And then even accepts Ambassador Kord's help at the end of the film. The man clearly can work with Klingons when the Federation needs him to. Captain on the bridge. Ah, sex in the sideburns. I mean sideburns in the city. I guess we'll be going down together. I mean, getting off together. Scotty is smiling because he knows none of his nephews can die on this mission. I've never trusted Klingons. And here's a visual reminder about the search for Spock that hopefully sells this notion, even though that was three movies ago. After he says the damning audio that comes back to haunt him later, we pan by the doorway and there was no one there at all. The movie is a liar, just like my college girlfriend who said she did kiss that towny Bryson but did not go all the way with him only for her to come up pregnant with Bryson's baby two months later. F***ing townies. You could have not. Or, and hear me out here, Starfleet could design cabin doors to only open when the occupant agrees to it. Ah, movie takes Valeris from Kirk quarters to Spock's quarters with only a standard exterior Enterprise shot in between. And I'm not proud of the wording, but Lieutenant Valeris sure gets around, doesn't she? Faith? Let the universe will unfold as it should. That's not faith, that's apathy. I intend you to replace me. In what capacity? Spock is a science officer and Valeris works at the helm. Shall we raise our shields, Captain? Never been this close. You have literally flown a Klingon ship in another movie. I am Chancellor Gorkon. And it's totally coincidental that I sound exactly like St. John Talbot and Gold Madrid. No relation. I am curious why you only have three lights working on the bridge of your ship, though. Or maybe it's four. Guess who's coming to dinner. If guess who's coming to dinner is still a valid reference in the 23rd century, I'm not sure the society is as advanced as Star Trek would like us to believe. Also, there's a lot of space out there to cover. Why is Kronos-1 hovering so close to the Enterprise? The Klingons really need to work on teaching their Helms people about personal space etiquette. As someone who has had many beards and various facial hair formations over the years, I can attest that the corners of the mouth are the hardest to keep clean as one eats. So the concept of someone growing facial hair only in that location is a huge red flag. They all look alike. That's racist, and I get that that's the point, but still, that's racist. You men have work. Yes, yes ma'am. And it I know Valeris says have work and not at work, but I've always wanted to sing that in the Sins video, and this might be the closest I get to fulfilling that dream. Also, right after Chancellor Gorkin is killed, if you just think back to this weird, uncomfortable moment, pretty obvious who the murderers are. Maybe it's great foreshadowing, but I'm an asshole, so you're still getting a sin. I offer a toast. The undiscovered country. <laughs> Roll credits. You have not experienced Shakespeare until you have read him in the original Klingon. I've always viewed this as trolling, but often I kind of wonder if Klingons actually think Shakespeare was from their planet, or stole from a writer from their planet. Would you be willing to give up Starfleet? The movie does a seamless job of replacing Kevin Spacey with Christopher Plummer. Please let me know if there's some other way we can screw up tonight. Torpedo shadowing! Also, Kirk is the one who played the Hitler card. Earth, Hitler, 1938. I'm not sure anyone else in his crew screwed anything up. Way to throw everyone under your own racist bus, Kirk. What is this sh here? It's a trophy and there's a human riding a fish, but then there's a golden bowl. Just what the hell did he do to win this trophy? A note to the galley, Romulan ale no longer to be served at diplomatic functions. Considering Romulan ale is very much illegal, I'm having a hard time buying that Kirk would make this declaration part of any kind of official captain's law. Here are two phasers that are set to neither vaporize nor stun, but instead are set to blow a small hole through the person. Now a phaser is detaching an arm like a lightsaber gun? Just gonna add five cents here for all the times this movie doesn't understand Star Trek phasers. With all the blood drops flying around, how are these the first ones the assassins have come in contact with? With a direct torpedo hit, you crippled our entire gravitational field! But are the Klingons not trained in combat scenarios where the gravitational fields have failed? That would seem to be extremely important when you're operating in f***ing outer space. Klingon blood is Pepto-Bismol! <laughs> oh, but still, please have the sads for the dead. It's so pink, though! <laughs> Jim, I don't even know his anatomy. You've been at this for 30 years and you never learned Klingon anatomy? Also, if you don't, then why the f*** did you say you could help? Bones just said he didn't know the Klingon anatomy, but he is performing CPR in the same spot a human's heart would be. But how would he know that's where a Klingon's heart is? The discoloration at the top of this uniform collar tells me that Spock, the character, wears neck makeup. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Did you know that the President of the Federation plays the piano? Because I did not know that. Wait, that might be a harpsichord. There's also a model of the Eiffel Tower when the actual thing is outside in the window next to it. Starfleet engineers were all, what do we need at the communication station on the bridge? What we definitely cannot live without is a graphic single color rendering of the Enterprise spinning on two axes. 
Oh, sir. The peace process will go forward. Why are they speaking English to each other? There are only Klingons in the room, and they were only speaking Klingon just a few seconds ago. Fortunately for the sake of the entire rest of the movie and that patch on Kirk's shoulder, the Klingon criminal justice system does not believe in prison uniforms, so Kirk and McCoy are arrested, held, put on trial, sentenced, and delivered to prison, all while still in their Starfleet uniforms. If the gravitational unit was not functioning, how could these men be walking? They appear to be wearing magnetic boots. Even the shittest of lawyers would be able to find out that information pre-trial and not be caught asking such an ignorant question. What would your favorite author say, Captain? Let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings. Leading the witness. They do eventually deduce where the audio clip from his captain's log came from, but right now it's weird to me that no one watching this trial on the Enterprise or at Starfleet is immediately questioning how the Klingons got their hands on what should be a pretty secure and classified audio document. Do you deny being demoted for these charges? Don't wait for the translation! Answer me now! Christopher Plummer slam f***ing dunks this performance, but he's a general. Why is a general acting as a prosecutor, but the defense gets a regular lawyer? Is the lawyer one of the steps in the military career track for Klingons? This is the most important case in the history of our race! Then get me a four-star general! I'm not gonna risk losing this case! And if it should be proved that members of your crew did, in fact, carry out such an assassination... Kirk then says he is responsible for the behavior of those under his command, and the state rests! And I feel like everyone is forgetting about that if in General Chang's question, because it has not been proven yet that the people in helmeted Starfleet uniforms who shot the Chancellor were actually Starfleet members. Repenting. Yes, that is shocking. Almost as shocking as the fact that the Enterprise is still out here. It had to have at least taken a day or two before the court proceedings, and even with pretending to have some communication systems down or whatever Uhura and Chekhov cooked up, wouldn't there be ships sent out for investigation purposes of the area where all this shit went down? Did Starfleet choose to do zero investigation of the matter? That doesn't make any sense. We fired. That is not possible. All weapons visually accounted for, sir. Which is something that was ridiculously not brought up at the trial. This is a fact that should require more investigation. The idea that no one would be investigating this outside the rogue Enterprise crew members is f***ing ludicrous. An ancestor of mine maintained that if you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Now we have a non-Earth person creating Occam's Razor. Is the movie making a commentary that most of our philosophical and creative achievements are inevitably going to be reached, achieved by any sentient race, or is it just a cute joke? Spock is not descended from Occam. We must inform Starfleet Command. Inform them of what? A new weapon that is invisible? Scotty would be the chief engineer at CinemaSense. They'll say that we're so desperate to exonerate the captain that we'll say anything. And they would be correct. We have no evidence. But you so f***ing do have evidence. You have visual evidence that no torpedoes were fired from the goddamn Enterprise. Maybe that could be disproven if someone poked around enough, but it's still goddamn evidence. This is legitimately some of the worst fake snow I've ever seen. These are instant mashed potato flakes. I realize snow isn't easy to fake, but you wrote the script here, not me. This guy died in like 20 seconds of exposure to the surface, but all these prisoners have been out here walking for who knows how long and standing here getting lectured with their faces completely exposed. This will help keep you warm. Weed is legal in f***ing Klingon prisons? Can I move to Rurapente? Klingon weed's gotta be off the rails good. Why are there chefs in here preparing roasted turkeys and soups? Yes, the replicator didn't come about until Next Generation, but the original series still had food synthesizers that created food cubes, and the animated series in the 70s had fully realized looking meals coming from the synthesizers. My point is, Starfleet is absolutely wasting money having a full kitchen staff on Starship preparing traditional four-course meals and shit. But also, you haven't had roasted turkey until you've prepared it in the traditional Klingon way. Why not simply leave? Vaporize them. Like this? Chekhov would f***ing know that you can't shoot a phaser on a starship without an alarm going off. He's a goddamn tactical officer. Also, instead of saying vaporizing things with phasers on ships sets off an alarm, she pulls a phaser from the kitchen wall-mounted armory, which is a thing apparently, and vaporizes a stockpot. But somehow not the mashed potatoes that were in the stockpot, and none of this makes any f***ing sense. When you vaporize a person, their skin doesn't disappear and leave their muscles and organs exposed. It vaporizes the skin and what was inside it. Did someone fire? off a phaser? Did someone send communications officer or her to check on an unauthorized phaser? Turns out this alien bully assassin has genitals on his knees, and look, if you have genitals on your knees, why do you wear pants with holes in the knees? But also, never has there been a more appropriate time for the high school cheer, rah rah ree, kick him in the knee, rah rah rass, kick him in the other knee. Not everybody keeps their genitals in the same place, Captain. Anything you want to tell me? Even when he and his friends' lives are on the line, Kirk can't help but be a sexist, perverted prick. 
What kind of self-respecting gulag lets their prisoners sleep? Bones inexplicably decides not to roll over, but to completely change the head-foot notions of his own bed. Yes, this is because we want to see his face while he talks to Kirk in this scene, and it's called blocking, but this maneuver makes zero sense outside of a film set. Movie has time for this. Go to lift seven in the morning for mining duty. They let the prisoners in this gulag choose their own work details? Starfleet urgently requests any data we have. I was during research for this video years old when I learned that Christian Slater's mom was the casting director for this film. So did he do her a favor after an actor bailed, or did she do him a favor by giving him a cameo? Until I know the answer, this is getting us in. But also, this is the second character in this movie to pronounce the word data wrong. Considering TNG has a character for seven seasons named Data with the other pronunciation, one has to assume this film's pronunciation is intentional affronted to TNG. TNG in general, and Brent Spiner specifically. If they've been doing a ship-wide search for the boots, how was this pretty obvious blood spatter not already noticed? How was it not noticed before they even started the search? These ships have cleaning crews, right? This crime scene examining device also blinds the investigator's eye with a bright red light. Opening drawers, sorting through uniforms, scanning beds. Excitement? Last night, you two were... Don't remind me. All kinds of shaming. We're supposed to be rooting for Kirk, right? That prisoner who froze in 20 seconds on the surface is looking more and more like an outlier. I'm wearing a Viridian patch on my back! Star Trek had its own version of the only used once ever time turner from Harry Potter with this Viridian patch bullshit. Spock slapped it there just before we went on Gorkin's ship! Thankfully, the Klingons never searched us or scanned us or made us change clothes, miraculously. They tricked the Klingons here linguistically, but shouldn't the Klingons be able to detect ships by type or signature or something by now, rather than just relying on radio contact? Earlier in this movie, Sulu just used his ship's camera to see all the way to Praxis. What is your destination? Over. I continue to call bullshit on no one, including Uhura aboard this ship, who is a goddamn communications officer knowing the Klingon language. What? This works. Man, I think everyone took the wrong lessons away from Superman 3. Not me, you idiot. HIM! That's a bit of luck that never gets reconciled. I wonder why they weren't vaporized. How did none of the senior officers know about this goddamn shipwide phaser alarm? For someone who finished top of her class at Starfleet Academy, Valera should know that the officers she shot were dead when she left and realized this is a trap. You cannot prove anything. It's this kind of pride that got her excluded from the Sex and the City reboot. Klingons cannot be trusted. Yep, the entire movie's point is that there were enough racist dickheads in power that they almost succeeded in starting a war to kill the minority Klingons, and this is the reflection of modern day America. Let them die, you said. He did, but he said that to Spock at the meeting where he was given his assignment to escort the Klingons. He didn't record that in a log, so Valeris would have no knowledge of that transaction. Unless that eavesdropper from before was working for her. She knows Spock can pull the truth out of her, and yet she still refuses to speak it aloud. What the f*** did the Klingons have on Valeris? Mind melding with another person without their explicit consent. Then we're dead. I've been dead before. <laughs> this movie's a blast. Contact Excelsior. She'll have the coordinates. You knew that, but you still wasted the last few minutes trying to break Lieutenant Valeris. If the CGI for Camp Kittimer is going to be so shitty, why not use a real Earth building with impressive construction incorporating nature? Dozens of those actually exist. I can see you, Kirk. Okay, huge sin question here. Can radio signals not be traced in space? The entire finale depends on the enemy ship being cloaked, but that same enemy ship is taunting the Enterprise throughout, as the radio signals are ubiquitous and elusive. The Enterprise will even go on to create a gas-seeking torpedo to track and eliminate the evil bad guy ship, but they they could simply have tracked the radio signal, yeah? And if cloak ships have some way of hiding the radio signal, which is bullshit, then at least tell us that. You're the auxiliary power! Auxiliary circuits destroyed, Captain. Then why aren't you all dead? This is just techno babble about shit that has no ultimate bearing on the outcome of the story, but is only intended to cause the audience to worry. What about all of that equipment we're carrying to catalog gaseous anomalies? Yes, Aurora, what about that? Because you guys were back home in San Fran, America, fiddle-farting away the last few months before retirement and only put out to space to meet up with the Klingon diplomats, so why the f*** does the Enterprise have gaseous anomaly-detecting bullshit fucking science gear on board? Things gotta have a tailpipe. A century or two beyond the gas-powered automobile, the term tailpipe has somehow survived and has become a common cultural touchstone. Target that explosion and fire. <laughs> God damn it, yes to the death power! <laughs> F***ing rules. Movie steals the Klingon ship explosion from Star Trek Generations. Jesus, was the graphic puddle of blood next to his head really necessary? Slow claps. Course heading, Captain. Second start of the ride. Stealing. I think I'm getting the black lung, Bob. That man is playing Galaga. Thought we wouldn't notice. From hell's heart, I stab at thee. Mrs. Timken loved what you did last night, but they think I did it. 
And they want me to keep coming up with brilliant windows. You gotta help me. Of course. We come in peace. And you go in pieces, asshole. Wide lanes. This is so luxurious. May I remind you that he and Dr. McCoy boarded Kronos One of their own free will? None of these facts are in dispute, Mr. President. Without our government, you'd be stuck in Siberia now, sucking the juice from a rotten commie potato. Three months before retirement. I'm too old for this shit. Before we get started, does anyone want to get out? Would you care to assist me in performing surgery on a torpedo? Damn it, man, I'm a doctor, not a torpedo technician. Mr. President! Ah! Denny Crane.